So it's my honor today to work with Pastor Nikki as uh, she works through what we're going to work through today. Um, the Old Testament is found on page 548. It is from Psalms. It's 92, chapter 92, verses 1 to 5. And I'll give you a minute for those of you that would like to find that. Page 548, Old Testament. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands, I sing for joy. How great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. Second reading, the New Testament reading, is found on page 40 of the New Testament, Mark 5 verses 35 to 41. Okay. And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, how can you say, who touched me? He looked at all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, your daughter's dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Tala Thekum, which means, little girl, get up. And the final reading is uh, from the epistle is Philippines 4, uh, page 198 in the New Testament. Four to seven. Rejoice in the Lord. Always, again I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Do pray with me. Lord God, empty me of me and fill me with your Holy Spirit so that the words of my mouth are only yours spoken through me. Lord, open the ears of the hearers here today that they may hear what it is that your Spirit is calling on their hearts to take from this message into their lives and into the world. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Now, as I said, today I was inspired through the work of the Holy Spirit to share with you a personal testimony. And that personal testimony happens to parallel the passage that Sharon just shared with you from Mark, a passage about fear, healing, miracles, and answered prayers. Now many of you already knew this, but Wednesday was my scheduled regular MRI checkup with my neuro-oncologist. Oftentimes in the life of having a cancer or a disease like cancer, checkups come with anxiety no matter how much you try to not allow it. Or no matter how much you follow Paul's advice in the scripture reading read today about not worrying and turning your prayer over to God with a thankful heart for all God has done and continues to do, those anxieties still manage to creep in. Well, this time, I didn't actually feel concerned. I wasn't anxious at all. After all, it's been nine years since my treatment was finished, and I have yet to have growth. Now, my appointment had to be changed to an earlier time and a different day to accommodate the doctor's schedule. And that meant that I was going to be leaving my house at 5.30 a.m. Now, typically, I get up in the morning and I do my devotional time, but because I had to leave so early, that devotional time was cut short. And unlike I have done in the past, I neglected to ask God for continued healing. But it was okay. I didn't feel anxious. Instead, I rushed out the door with my good friend Sarah, who takes me every time we go, and she came and picked me up, and we are enjoying our usual conversation as we trek down to Philadelphia to see the doctor, and all was well. In our morning conversation, Sarah and I had said how great it is to actually have these appointments, because we get to see each other. It's the only time we get to see each other. And she said she loves knowing that I continue to be okay. You see, my dear friend is 71 years old. She does not have a computer. She does not have a cell phone. And she lives deep in the woods. She would only know that I was okay by going with me because she knows it would be very difficult to call her after every time I go. Every time we go, she tells me it's a gift that she can take me. But funny thing is, this time, Sarah, my good friend, who happens to be an atheist, said it is a blessing for her to take me, not a gift. And I thought, God, wow, you have answered my prayers. But the greatest gift, the greatest blessing, is that she is the gift to me. She is the blessing to me. I was caught up in this sense of gratefulness and awe for God's work that when the doctor told me she thought there was regrowth, I was taken back. I didn't know what to do, and the fear began to creep in. My trust in God and the thankfulness had taken a back seat to the fear that was boiling up. I was trying to squash that fear, which is why I asked the question to the doctor, okay, what next? What's the treatment plans? To would she explain the surgery and the treatment options that would likely be? You see, I was asking this question because I was trying to resolve this fear myself and putting my trust in the doctor's options and in the medical community. 
I never even asked God for healing. In fact, I didn't even talk to God until I was leaving the office, and all I was asking God was, should I tell my husband right away or not? I knew the doctor had said this was a preliminary reading of the MRI, and that the end result, the official report, would be the tell-all, and that would come later. So I should have said to myself, Hello, Nikki. This means you should pray for the results to be wrong. But all I could do was let that fear take hold of me and let it control me. Now eventually I called Chris to let him know what was going on and I prayed that that radiology report would come out with a stable diagnosis. And my prayers and my trust in God squashed those fears but only for the time being. Because when the radiology report was taking longer than usual to show up in my online chart, I again felt the infliction of those fears creeping back up with all the negative thoughts that come with them. So I turned again to prayer and I petitioned God for healing and removal of all the fears. I fell asleep confident that God would continue offer healing in whatever way it was. However, I woke up in the middle of the night with the fear creeping back in, but this time, the fear was not about the cancer coming back. It was about who and how and when and what order should I tell people? How do I tell my church family? How do I tell the leadership? How do I tell my own family? But eventually, through prayer, I was able to get rest knowing that God's plan is greater than mine, and I didn't need to figure out who, where, when, or how, because God would do that. Now after waking up, some of those fears again began to creep in. Because immediately I turned to my phone and checked on that online chart and it still wasn't there. Why wasn't it posted in my chart? It had to mean that there was something wrong. But then during my devotional time was when I was reminded that I have been called for a purpose. That purpose may just include cancer's return, or more brain surgery and treatment, or it may include none of that. What remained in my mind is that it all didn't matter. It all didn't matter because I need not fear anything. The words that spoke to me that morning was, do not fear, only believe. The words found in the passage from Mark. These words I knew came not only from God, but were written in scriptures. And as I read this passage from the Gospel of Mark, all the parallels to what was going on in my life began to emerge. For example, Jairus is a person of authority in the synagogue. He is a Jewish community leader who perceives who Jesus is. I am a religious leader who perceives who Jesus is. Jarius, like myself, experiences firsthand God's ability to perform miracles through Christ's work. Finally, like Jarius, I too have experienced God's miracle of giving life to someone who is perceived to be dead. Because you see, statistically speaking, I should be dead. But I have been given life. Then there's this interruption in the story with another story of a woman who is plagued with a medical condition that has caused her to be viewed negatively and is driven to poverty by trying to resolve it. Jesus is her last hope for a miracle. She, like me, had to put her hope in Jesus and ask for a miracle. 
Yet a miracle is not the most notable parallel in this story. Instead, the most notable parallel is around the subject of fear. The hemorrhaging woman comes to Jesus, as it says, in fear and trembling. Not the fear of dying, but the fear of knowing the one that she is coming into relationship is a God who is awesome and all-powerful. With Jairus, we see fear of another kind. He is told not to bother Jesus because his, first, his worst fear had already come true. His child is dead. Both experienced fears of different kinds. Jesus, knowing the power that fear has, reminds both Jairus and the woman to not fear, but only believe. Believe in the power of God that can overcome all things. During those two days, I experienced fear. Sometimes like that of the woman and other times like that of Jairus. Now, I recognize that I am a miracle. The percentage of long-term survivors with my diagnosis is virtually zero. And no amount of money or status has improved that prognosis. But I also recognize that God, despite pleas, doesn't always answer prayers with a miracle. I also recognize that, that God, let's face it, if answered all of our prayers for miracles, they wouldn't seem like miracles at all. Through these past few days, I have learned what Jarius and the hemorrhaging woman learned, that a miracle of healing was experienced. I was given a stable diagnosis. However, the even greater miracle was I was reminded of the gift of being able to rest in that finished work of Christ that we discussed last week. The reality is the real answer to my prayer for ultimate healing was answered. I have been healed, not of the brain cancer, but from the fear of brain cancer. I have been given a chance again to not fear, only believe. My reality is that statistically speaking, I am on borrowed time. However, I rejoice in being healed of the fears that allows the evil one to do its work in me. I can trust that God knows the number of my days, whatever they will be, and I'm fine with that because I rest knowing Christ is in me and I am in Christ. Let us all remember that no matter what struggle we face, no matter what suffering we are enduring, we need not fear, but believe. Only believe. I need not fear anything this cancer journey brings me. Let us all remember that no matter what struggle we face, we need not fear. Believe that Christ can heal us in the way, whatever way that may be. We need not fear because as God promises, he will be with us through all of eternity, through all of our suffering. God is with us because Christ has made that sure. Hallelujah. Amen.